I'm Dr. Robert Hegley, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you to today's educational activity entitled Overcoming Obstacles, Expert Perspectives on the Diagnosis and Management of Familial Chylomicronemia Syndrome. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from Ionis Pharmaceutical uh, Company. Uh, today's program is being brought to you by CME Outfitters, which is an award-winning, accredited provider of, of uh, continuing education for clinicians uh, worldwide. Uh, some housekeeping. Follow us on X. More information there. So I'd like to introduce our faculty for this evening. So if you discount me, we have an, ex an ex extremely esteemed faculty. I'll start with myself, though. <laughs> so I'm a Rob Hegley. I'm an endocrinologist professor of medicine in London, Canada. And also joining me this evening, I'm absolutely thrilled, two superstars in lipids, uh, Alan Chait, a professor at, in the University of Washington, uh, esteemed endocrinologist, lipid specialist in Seattle, and uh, from San Diego, uh, my colleague, Dr. Joseph Whitstam, a professor of medicine, uh, endocrinology, division of endocrinology and metabolism at the University of California in San Diego. And we are absolutely thrilled to have with us tonight to give the patient perspective, uh, Mr. Jeff Wirtalik, a patient advocate of the S FCS Foundation uh, from uh, Mission Vallejo, uh, California. So uh, we have uh, learning objectives for this evening, and I will go over these uh, in order. So the first objective is to identify key diagnostic elements of FCS. The second objective is to integrate multidisciplinary approaches that may facilitate adherence to FCS dietary guidelines. And then third, to assess recent study data evaluating current and emerging FCS pharmacologic therapies. Hypertriglyceridemia uh, is a very, very common clinical problem. Uh, like probably the most, most common referral in, in my lipid clinic. Uh, and it's associated with numerous secondary factors, including age, uh, elevated blood glucose, uh, higher uh, body mass index, obesity, waist circumference, um, also with total cholesterol, and very commonly this yin-yang relationship that I'm sure you're all familiar with, with reduced HDL cholesterol. Uh, so of the American population, 18% of people have triglycerides greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter and 0.4% greater than 1,000. So that 0.4% uh, is actually, you know, extremely common. It, it seems like a small number, but in absolute terms, it's actually quite, uh, quite a large number. And the Associated medical conditions include obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, chronic uh, liver or kidney disease, and then a, a wide range of hormones and, and drugs. Okay, so just a question to begin. And uh, this is multiple choice, and you'll have the opportunity to enter your uh, responses. I'm going to read it because we're already getting responses. You guys are like so smart. So like I'm OK, but I will I will quickly read. But uh, but please feel free to enter your responses. When do you suspect familial chylomicronemia syndrome in your patient? When extreme triglyceride levels cannot be explained by other causes? When a patient has got high LDL and normal HDL? when an overweight patient has got high triglycerides and atherosclerosis, when an older patient experiences pancreatitis or uh, the common option or uh, a friendly uh, option is I don't know. So please go ahead and respond and we'll tally your, uh, tally your responses. Okay, 
So we have then our uh, our um, summary here. And so just to, just to show you that the correct answer is indicated with the box when extreme triglyceride levels cannot be explained by other causes. And we have mo about half of our participants have chosen that answer. And then um, about a quarter, we're not sure. And then uh, the minority had the answers that were uh, that were incorrect. So the, the point here is that um, familial chylomicronemia syndrome is uh, a, a subset of these um, extreme or severe hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, typically in adult patients that we see, there are secondary causes or other causes that are associated, but if in the absence of other causes, this should then trigger you to think, well, maybe this could be FCS. Okay, let's start with the uh, with our case for this evening. We'll come back. I mean, there are like some of the elements in those questions will uh, will be uh, will be covered. So Richard, he's a 19 year old male, uh, presents to the um, to the emergency room. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, at this point, I, I have jumped the gun here. This is the this is a case that is provided by Dr. Chait, and and I would. I would actually love Dr. Che to uh, to take over at this point. All right, Rob, thank you. Um, so um, as uh, as you've just heard, this is a 19-year-old man who presents to the emergency room with a considerable abdominal discomfort. Um, his history is that he's had intermittent abdominal pain for many years, um, most commonly after he goes to parties. Uh, he's now at college and his episodes of abdominal pain have actually increased since uh, going to college. Uh, his family history is negative for both pancre pancreatitis and cardiovascular disease. But the evening prior to his current visit to the ER, um, he attended the opening of baseball season and uh, he had some hot dogs, some beer, and that seemed to have precipitated the abdominal pain. Um, so on physical examination, he's five foot seven. He's only weighs 120 pounds with a BMI of 18.8. He's got a slight fever. His pulse is 132, blood pressure, as you can see. Um, and he's in considerable ab discomfort with general abdominal tenderness but particularly marked tenderness in the upper in the upper quadrants um, his labs he's got a plasma triglyceride of 6378 milligrams per deciliter his cholesterol is relatively low when compared with his triglycerides his sodium is low at 125 potassium 4 blood glucose normal at 91 and has a high serum amylase confirming a diagnosis of pancreatitis. So here we have a young male uh, who has, who's underweight, he's not diabetic, and he has confirmed pancreatitis and a high triglyceride. So this is triglyceride induced pancreatitis. And when you see extreme triglyceride levels like this, there's almost always a genetic component. And on the right, uh, upper corner, you will see what his plasma looked like. You can see on the left the creamy, almost tomato soup appearance of his plasma when drawn and just sitting around for a few minutes before it's even centrifuged. This is compared with what a normal plasma would look like on the right. So um, Richard has triglyceride-induced pancreatitis. Um, the next slide is actually probably one of the most important slides around because I'm going to go through this slowly because this is going to realize, really help us differentiate two of the causes of severe pancreatitis, by which I mean triglycerides above a thousand. Now, um, the situation here is in the middle panel, we have familial chylomicronemia syndrome the topic that we're talking about today. And on the right, we have what we call polygenic multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. And it's really important to, differ to differentiate these two. The reason for which is that um, if you have reg proper FCS, it is a major burden on the patient's life, as you'll hear 
from um, Mr. Wirtelik in just a, sh a few moments. And also the treatment is completely different from the much more common multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. So let's start off with um, the, uh, the old names. Uh, if you still use the Fredrickson classification, which I don't think you should, um, it was type one for familial chylomicronemia syndrome and type five for the MCS. Um, the major differences in the lipoproteins is that in FCS, it's really chylomicrons that accumulate, whereas in MCS, chylomicrons, very low density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins and remnants of the triglyceride rich lipoproteins can accumulate. Um, the other lipoprotein abnormalities in, um, in FCS, VLDL, LDL and HDL cholesterol are all reduced. So it's really chylomicrons that are accumulating. So LDL levels would be low and ApoB levels would be low. Whereas in MCS, chylomicrons, VLDL and their remnants accumulate. So you're gonna get much higher cholesterols uh, in association with a very severe hypertriglyceridemia. Um, in terms of the onset, it's oftentimes is in the pediatric group that we see, first see FCS. Um, here you oftentimes will find an infant who's, who fails to thrive and has found to have milky plasma. This is classical FCS, but as you'll hear, um, many patients will present in adulthood as our patient um, uh, advocate today will tell us. Um, it's always in adulthood that you see the presentation of MCS. Uh, the prevalence, and this is truly important, uh, the prevalence is about one in a million for MCS. For FCS, it's extremely rare, where it's about one to 400 and five to 500,000 for multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. In other words, it's much, much even though rare, it's much, much more common than FCS. And this is really important because what the goal of this program today is to help you identify those rare cases of FCS that require preferential and special treatment. Um, the genetics you're gonna hear a lot more about from uh, Dr. Hegley in just a moment, uh, and I'm not gonna say much more about it at this point in time. One other thing that's important to notice is a history of cardiovascular disease in the family. It's almost always absent in FCS and often present in MCS. Um, secondary factors are minimal or absent in FCS and are quite common in MCS, including factors such as those uh, associated with the metabolic syndrome. Um, the genetic causes Dr. Hegley will talk about and the treatment, again, is quite different. Um, and this will be discussed by Dr. Whitstam as we progress with the program. So um, let's talk once another one other thing about differentiating the two. What I'm showing here is FCS in blue, MCS in red. And what you will see is that the individual patient with FCS has more pancreatitis, and more episodes of multiple, uh, multiple episodes of pancreatitis. Now you can see it's much higher in the blue bars than in the red bars. But remember, this is for an individual patient per patient. When you think about the prevalence of the diseases, MCS is so much more common that actually when you see a patient in the emergency room presenting with triglyceride induced pancreatitis, it's much, much more likely to be due to MCS. Uh, cardiovascular disease hardly occurs in, um, in, um, in FCS, and um, it's, it does occur quite commonly in MCS. And as I've already alluded to, metabolic syndrome features are rare in FCS and much more common in, um, in, in, in uh, MCS. But again, remember the difference in prevalence between the two disorders. And again, you will see much more common metabolic features in uh, the multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome. Um, so at this point, I think it's time, uh, I want to just give you 
one more slide, which I think will help in the clinical differentiation between these two disorders. Um, so let's start off on the left side of this panel when you've got a patient who's got triglycerides above a thousand. This can be um, diagnosed at the time of just a routine blood examination or blood taken for any other disorders such as a patient who's got diabetes or as in the case that we're talking about today when the patient comes to the emergency room with abdominal pain or pancreatitis. So um, what has been devised by a number of groups throughout the world are screening tools. And um, on the right, in the middle here, we see, we see one such screening tool. This was devised in Europe, and um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting one. Basically, it gives eight factors, listed one to eight, and gives a particular score for each individual factor. So for example, if you've got a fasting triglyceride greater than 10 millimoles on three consecutive blood draws, that gives you a score of five. Uh, there's a negative score, uh, one of these is a negative score uh, with, if you had a previous triglyceride of less than two millimoles, that's a negative score. And uh, in terms of converting millimoles per litre to, uh, to, to uh, milligrams per deciliter, to make it simple, just divide by 100, or just multiply by 100. It's actually 88.6, but for practical purposes, 100 will get you the right answer. So let's add up the scores. When you have an individual patient, you've added up the scores. If you've got greater than 10, FCS is likely, very likely. If you've got less than five, FCS is unlikely, very unlikely, and then in between. And then some other additional characteristics have been added to these screening tools. And for example, um, a low uh, BMI, um, that would be another reason for having uh, for thinking more of FCS and a low LDL cholesterol below 40 milligrams per deciliter, this too would give you um, the feeling of a low FCS. And then if possible, once you've made a clinical diagnosis of FCS, then if you have the ability to do so, a genetic diagnosis is really the gold standard for confirming the diagnosis. So before we go on, I, I'd like to bring Mr. Uh, Wirtlick into the story. And uh, Jeff, I'd like to maybe um, ask you a few questions uh, related to what I've just said. So how old were you when you were diagnosed with FCS? Um, my diagnosis honestly didn't come until about five years ago. Uh, and I was 42. I'm at your gray beard. You're not 20 years old anymore or no. 50. So, it, it took many, many years um, to find someone who understood what I was going through. So you'd been complaining to doctors for a long time, but they hadn't come up with the correct diagnosis. Is that is that correct? Okay? I, I've had my gallbladder removed unnecessarily. Um, alcoholism was constantly thrown at, at myself and my wife, which was not an issue. Okay. And... Um, so how many misdiagnoses would you say you had before the correct diagnosis was made? At least five before I finally found a lipid specialist. Okay, fine. And, um, and, and how did they make the correct diagnosis? Was it on clinical grounds or were you genetically tested? It was clinical grounds. He understood what I had been going through. I had even had the, uh, the skin condition that is, is very common with FCS patients which dermatologists just called an acute dermatitis. Um, and I presume you're referring, my story, he was able to. You're, you're referring to eruptive xanthoma, I presume, is that correct? Yes. And the usual site of that is on the buttocks. Is that where you had yours? Um, I was fairly covered. Uh, covered, yeah. yeah. Oftentimes it's confined to the buttocks. And, you know, in the clinic, we often don't examine patients' buttocks and we'll miss them. So um, a point of guidance for clinicians listening to this, when you have a patient with a high triglycerides, examine their buttocks. Um, okay, and uh, Jeff, I, I alluded to the fact that people with FCS tend to be, have a lower BMI. Are you, where do you, where do you fit in that scheme? Are you? Uh, I'm a little right? more on the upper BMI. Just oh, genetic all right, so you, you're a slightly unusual character for, a, for FCS. Correct, do you I'm 6'5 and about 270 pounds. Oh, wow. Okay. 
do, do you have any secondary features, any other disorders, diabetes, um, any other conditions? Um, I'm battling with diabetes a little bit. Um, other than that, no. Now, with diabetes in people with with FCS oftentimes is a result of multiple episodes of pancreatitis leading to pancreatic damage. Have you had pancreatitis? And if so, how often? Yes, for until I was diagnosed, I had pancreatitis about seven times, I believe. Okay, um, so it's quite Over, possible that your diabetes might be related to pancreatic damage. Uh, very okay. possible. Uh, anything else you'd like to tell us, Jeff, before we move on? It's just challenging to find uh, a doctor who understands what you're going through. I live in New Jersey and uh, obviously being close to New York City, there are specialists all over. And still it took me until I was 42 years old to get a proper diagnosis. Um, I hear many things in different FCS groups that I'm in where people just don't know where to turn. They're asking other patients for help, which is not the best clinical uh, assistance you can get. So it's very, very challenging in, in many parts of the country and uh, other countries as well. Well, I guess that's the purpose of this CME program is to try and make people understand really what the disorder is, how to diagnose it, and as we'll hear towards the end, how to treat it. So at this point, I think it would be important to talk about the genetic diagnosis. And um, Dr. Hegley, who's really one of the world's experts on diagnosis of FCS and other genetic disorders of lipoprotein metabolism. Um, Rob, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alan. And thank you, uh, Jeff. That was, uh, that was very, very informative, you know, to, to, to hear the, the, the details of your own story. So we, we actually have seen that there, there are patients like yourself, for sure, in the cohorts of familial colomicronemia syndrome who make it quite far into adulthood and then when we do the genetic testing, they've got two, they've got two alleles. So the first thing is that on the genetic basis, the familial colomicronemia syndrome, it is a biallelic condition. So uh, this is now the current term of art for, we used to say homozygous, maybe that's something you might be more familiar with from your like medical school genetics or autosomal recessive, so we're, we're, but, but the point is biallelic. So that's now the, what we're, the, at least the genetics community is using. So it means two alleles. So like being a heterozygote, having one copy. Now, sometimes that's enough to then drive your triglycerides over a thousand, but we find that the heterozygotes are more re represented in the uh, multifactorial colomicronemia syndrome. And also heterozygotes are more common in society in general and if the heterozygosity impairs you and then there's a secondary factor on top and then then the triglycerides go really high so in but in true true you know uh pure pure wool fcs it's a biallelic disorder where where in fact it's one of these five genes so it's lipoprotein lipase which is the main endothelial bound lipase that is responsible for hydrolyzing the um, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, so both chylomicrons and VLDL. But you know the blockade is so severe that, in fact, the, that first step, the diet, the chylomicrons from the diet, um, you know, cannot be broken down, and so there is very little substrate later on for the liver to make VLDL. So the the, the blockade when you have complete lipoprotein lipase deficiency, this is like you may then remember that term like Fredrickson type one or LPL deficiency. So th that that causes the accumulation of chylomicrons, and then everything else downstream which requires, you know, processing and remodeling and then reuptake by the liver and then putting back out by, by the liver and as VLDL. So that's all compromised because this initial blockade is so severe because both alleles are non-functional. So we used to think that that was the only case. And then maybe you might remember from like, if you read up to date or whatever, oh yeah, APOC2, I remember that. That's in Harrison's. That's a, so that's another way. APOC2 is a cofactor for lipoprotein lipase. Uh, but we've, what we've learned in recent years is that there are these three other genes that are sort of interacting with lipoprotein lipase, either at the 
its point of synthesis and secretion. So for example, that lipase maturation factor, LMF1, or ApoA5, that's, a, uh, that's an apolipoprotein that circulates with triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and that activates lipoprotein lipase. And then there's this really important protein discovered by Steve Young, GPI-HBP1. That's a real vegetable soup. I won't even, like, you know, it's going to take me the rest of the, the rest of our time just to spell out the full name. So, uh, but that's, that's another way. In fact, that's the second most common cause. So uh, when we look at patients and we, when we break them down, these biallelic patients where in fact they are completely lacking in lipoprotein lipase or one of these uh, four cofactors, 60 to 80% are the first, are LPL. But then the other sort of 20 to 30% are then one of these other four minor types. And then of that, it's most most common, like number two is GPI-HBP1 and then ApoA5. And then LMF1 is actually the least common. So here, this slide was put together when there were just a few reported families in the literature. But now with genetic testing and diagnosis, uh, these are coming up. These are actually much, much more common than just a few families. Still a rare disorder, but now instead of just a few families in the archives of the literature, we have, you know, hundreds of cases of each uh, that have been uh, documented and deposited in genetics uh, databases. But by far the big one is LPL. And these are now found on these targeted sequencing panels that you can order from commercial genotyping companies that will uh, test these and then we'll come up with and then if you have them both two alleles, or sometimes you can even have one allele in one gene and another allele in another gene, we call those double heterozygotes. So that can also cause the phenotype. However, more commonly what you would see if you order this test is you would get like a heterozygote coming back and you think, huh. So the heterozygote either means it's multifactorial chylomicronemia syndrome, or it's just, um, uh, you know, we, we you know incomplete. The, we haven't found the second mutation, or this, or the genotyping company hasn't found the uh, the second mutation. But anyway, these are the five that, that you that you need to know and that you would need to look for if you have ordered a genetic test, and you would be looking for both two alleles uh, as opposed to just one allele. Okay, so. Um, so, and the, I should also say genetic testing is becoming more accessible. The, the cost is coming down. I mean, there's still an issue of cost and accessibility. On the other hand, it's a one-time test. Um, and uh, you don't have to keep doing the, repeating the genetic testing. And, you know, the cost for a panel, you know, could be now somewhere, you know, between, say, $500 or $1,000. Um, so it's expensive, but on the other hand, it's a one-time test. Anyway, our patient here that uh, Dr. Uh, Chait had been discussing didn't get genetic testing. He just received the clinical diagnosis using that scoring system and uh, then received uh, dietary counseling. And so this was fat restriction. So you all know about this. You know, this is like typical the, what you would find in uh, in up-to-date or, or, you know, like most recent, uh, you know, uh, treatment guidelines for, for how to manage this or so restrict high glycemic, high fructose foods, eliminate alcohol, obviously, and then review medications. Uh, FCS, and, and this, this is really interesting, that it's commonly misdiagnosed. It's a diagnostic odyssey, five visits to the clinic uh, before the uh, correct diagnosis is made, uh, sometimes up to 30 visits to the clinic before somebody twigs onto the idea that this could be uh, a chylomicronemia disorder. So uh, the these uh, the uh, Michael Davidson reported uh, patient experiences in pursuing a low fat diet, and you can read these uh, here. I mean, these are described. But I think what I'd like to do at this point is bring back uh, Jeff and um, maybe. What what like and to me it's a universal thing talking to everybody whether they know each other whether they've met with FCS but everybody has um, their perspective their story about the diet and then like what the ideal diet is and how difficult that is to adhere to so maybe Jeff would you mind uh, giving us your lived experience with uh, with the the issues with diet. Sure. Um, the most challenging thing is that it sucks. Let, let's put it right out there. 
Um, you can only have so much grilled chicken and brown rice and spinach in so many different ways. Uh, it is very challenging, uh, especially for young children to go out, uh, similar to nut allergies, but nut allergies, you know to stay away from nuts and, and other things. With FCS, there are so many foods that you can't even touch because of just fat content. Um, a, a simple uh, bag of popcorn from a um, company that is very healthy and says it's, it's a low calorie alternative, still has six grams of fat per serving, which is at least half of what they're supposed to have in one day. Right. Going out to dinner can be even more challenging or breakfast. You don't know what they're cooking with in the, in the kitchen. You can ask for low fat foods, but there's probably some oil going on the pan. There's butter everywhere. Uh, you really have to pay attention and know your limits. Um, I have young children. So we end up making two dinners almost every night during the week yeah, because right. they don't want quinoa with sriracha sauce or <laughs> lots of vegetables. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. So then, yeah, my, my patients tell me, you know, many, it's just, it's an, it's an interesting echo and it's just because of it. So, so the, the, and, and does it ever happen that you think you're doing great? You are actually being, you know, diligent and religious with the diet and yet you still, you know, you still find out your like triglycerides are a thousand or whatever. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, one time I went for some blood work and I was walking all tall and came in and uh, two days later, 1300. Yeah. It crushed me. It, it is almost soul crushing because you, you work hard. You're not enjoying your meals as much. Um, and you, you think you've done it and reality sets in. Yeah. It's, it's a very, very, I mean, your, your, your story. So first of all, very clear and, uh, you know, uh, but it's, but it is a very, it's so common to, to patients with this condition. The other thing is that because of the fat restriction, there is this point about, you know, the, the risk of, fat soluble vitamin deficiency. So that's something that always has to be borne in mind. Um, the, the, the other thing is that then this ends up having a psychological effect as well. And you, you're sort of starting to allude to that, um, uh, Jeff, but there is this, uh, you know, the, in addition to just experiencing the symptoms, despite the fact that you're adhering to the diet, it's just your your all oh, your your diet becomes the focus of your life. I mean, it's like three times a day or more. And then uh, this survey from Mike Davidson showed an impact on employment and you know emotional well being. You can you can sense that that well being yes. and social relationships. So is, is, financial is, stress is, and so many healthy foods. Uh, MCT yeah. oil, which is a somewhat viable alternative for some people, it's very yeah. expensive. Right. Right. Do you, so I, you know, just further along that line. So you, do you, is that something at least that kind of breaks the monotony for you if you have MCT oil or is that like, what, what have you found with the a medium chain triglyceride oil? Um, it it's, seems to help a little bit. Um, yeah. It's not, again, it's not something you have all the time. I'm, right. Even in the winter, I'm outside on the grill, not trying to cook in a pan or right. uh, yeah. Yeah. So trying to stay very focused. You're, you're, For me, like at least, I have to be extremely diligent in my eating to have high triglycerides. Yes. <laughs> and that's really one of the biggest challenges is you struggle to be high. Right. Not even right. good. Yeah. So, you know, we, yeah, so we, we, we can, you know, the triglycerides can still run relatively high for an average person, like even like 500, you're out of the risk of pancreatitis. But, but, but yeah, it's still, and it's a, it's a focus. Your life revolves around it. I think that's right. the, um, yeah. So the, we need, we want to get to treatment really soon, but I, but I did, you know, I think that your perspective is so, so valuable. So here, you know, the ideal approach, you know, in a, uh, it would be a multi a multidisciplinary team where, in fact, we have like a dietitian who is familiar with a low fat diet, and, uh, and then you know the lipidologist who can like weigh in with uh, you know possible pharmacologic treatments. You know the uh, the family doc or the primary care provider who is there on the front line, psychologist or counselor. Sometimes they, 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 that in fact these issues with. Uh, you know, depression, eating disorders uh, are, as you can imagine, I mean, would be uh, um, would be common. And then other specialists. Yes, the that the psychological need. component has become more prevalent from what I can see. Uh, yeah. 
online and, and just talking to people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, so living with FCS, there's not one, there's not a one size food plan. Um, but well, by the way, when you're, you, so do you, you count grams of fat? So you're doing this sort of like, I'm guessing maybe you're sort of 15 or 20 grams or less than that. I, I'm day. fortunate. I can sit around 20 without, uh, having, uh, crazy issues. Yeah. So right. I have a little bit more flexibility, but it, it's still not all that much. No, it's not. When you consider the average American diet, it would be like 80, 80 grams or more, 100 grams, right. you know, and it's like, yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it is it is a big sacrifice and it it does, you know, it, it does really change the focus of your life. So we, we want to establish, obviously, in an ideal world, a collaborative team and develop an individualized treatment plan and then promote a healthy weight and all of these I don't want to call them platitudes. They, these are all really true, true aspects of living with FCS. You know, make a list of favorite foods. There's sometimes, and then get to the root of what you know fuels your cravings, and then FCS friendly versions of foods. So there are there are strategies, and, and in fact, the, some some lipid clinics actually do do have this, and hopefully now with social networking and. And the internet that that in fact some of the some of the tips and tricks that are used in, in clinics can become more uh, more widely known so we want to like empower people to control and individualize their diet and uh you know that would then at least help with long-term adherence does any of this ring ring true or are there any uh anything that this brings to mind jeff this uh points oh, on this line? definitely you know and the the sad thing is on paper it looks great saying it yeah. sounds phenomenal uh, executing long term is, is challenging, yeah. uh, but there are more outlets. There are uh, more sites that you can go to, and different recipes. And uh, I'm involved in a lot of different aspects and trying to just share information, which right. is why I think this is so great what we're all doing tonight. For sure, absolutely. So these are then the lifestyle recommendations, very low fat. You can see the fat content there, either in terms of grams or percent fat. Uh, and then, you know, some some tips there in terms of then, you know, we had talked about medium chain triglycerides, avoiding alcohol, avoid simple sugars just for the, you know, the, the glycemic load, and then achieving adequate, you know, intake of uh, fluids, water, electrolyte balance nutrient dense foods, you make sure that the essential fatty acids are met. So these are all, um, you know, key uh, dietary components, fat free or low fat uh, foods. Whoops. And then I just wanted to, we have a question coming up. So now just going to go back to Richard. So Richard, as you can imagine, he's having issues. He's like, he's 19. Uh, difficulty adhering to the diet. His triglycerides have come down, but they're still over two, over two thousand. He's still at like at risk of pancreatitis. Um, pharmacotherapy, in terms of our standard, you know, fibrate, statin, niacin, because there is a lack of lipoprotein lipase or lipolytic capacity. These traditional therapies, you think, oh yeah, well, just you know, put them on a statin and a fibroid that should clear it up. Ah, uh, no, wrong in FCS, like where, where there is the genetic issue, the genetic deficiency, these traditional drugs don't help. And in fact, the diet is the cornerstone of treatment. Uh, let's go to the, the next uh, question and answer uh, section and uh, I'll read it. What is the major finding? There was a, there was a study a few years ago in the, uh, in the New England Journal on a, a new drug for high triglycerides for familial colomicronemia, valanosaurcin. Lanosaurcin mediated clinical benefit in triglyceride reduction was rapid and was maximal by the fourth week, uh, but ceased by eight months. Anemia was a common side effect or common cause for discontinuation occurred in a third of the patients. There was ocular injury occurred, uh, ocular injury associated with Lanosaurcin was limited to the first three months, no new cases. Lanosaurcin induced a dose-dependent and prolonged reduction of plasma apoc3 and concomitant lowering of plasma triglycerides or if you're not sure just click on you don't know so we'll hear that lovely music again
Okay, so the correct answer was actually uh, outlined in the box. Um, so balanosaurcin induced a drop in APOC3. It's an APOC3 inhibitor, and Dr. Whitstam will get to that mechanism in a minute. And it lowered triglyceride levels. So all the other answers, the ocular injury, anemia, you know, clinical like transient clinical benefit, those were all false. So what we had here with it, Valanosaurcin was a proof of concept that if you interfered or reduced APOC3, that this would be associated with improvement, dramatic improvement in triglyceride levels. And so at this point, I'm going to turn the uh, 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 session over to uh, Dr. Whitstam in San Diego. Thank, thank you, Rob. Excuse me, I managed to get a call of my grandson in the last few days. I wanted to um, use a series of cartoons to try to explain to you a little bit about triglyceride metabolism and why the drugs that you usually use to lower triglycerides don't work and why in the last 10 years we've uh, developed a novel understanding of a new way to approach uh, lowering triglycerides that's applicable to FCS, that is by um, interfering with the production of apolipoprotein C3. So in this little cartoon, if you imagine that Erlenmeyer flask is your plasma uh, containing triglycerides. So there are two sources of input of triglycerides into the plasma. There's the liver on the left, which comes into the form of, makes triglycerides in the form of, and imports them in form of VLDL. And then the intestines, which put colomicrons into the uh, bloodstream. And these consist of di completely driven by dietary fat. And then there are outputs, by far, as as uh, Rob explained to you, like protein lipase shown on the left is the dominant pathway that leads to hydrolysis of triglycerides and clearance, and is by far the most important. And then there's another pathway called the LPL independent pathway, which is made up of a number of um, less specific pathways, uh, less high affinity, so to speak, but also involved in clearing uh, triglycerides. Now, the important point to note is that if you, the, and the reason that colomicron di, a restricted fat diets work is when you restrict fat in the diet, you remove colomicron input into plasma. And that's a major source of triglyceride input into the plasma. And to date, it's the only effective form of therapy. And as uh, Rob explained, all of the other drugs we use, uh, for hypertriglyceridemia primarily depend on having LPL dependent clearance and you need active lipoprotein lipase. So one of the things that the last uh, 10 years of history um, and an extensive research has taught us is that an apolipoprotein called APOC3, which is made primarily in the liver, and it enters uh, into the plasma on VLDL, or it comes from the gut in form of colomicrons, uh, it was noticed that the APOC3 levels and triglyceride levels correlated very highly. And then it was shown in animal experiments that if you inhibited APOC3, you inhibited, um, you raised, you, you, you lower triglycerides, and it was directly shown the mechanism is that APOC3 actually inhibits lipoprotein lipase activity. And so, <clears throat> the lanosaurcin um, is a, an antisense drug that's an oligonucleotides that are injected into the blood and they go to the liver and then they bind to the RNA that is responsible for APOC3 production. And as a result, it causes degradation of the APOC3 message RNA and therefore a decrease of APOC3 production. And it was theorized, therefore, that if you inhibited APOC3 and lowered plasma levels of APOC3, 
you would in fact remove that inhibition on lipoprotein protein lipase, and therefore you would lower triglycerides. And this was shown in a study um, that was published over 10 years ago now. Uh, and it was shown that in fact, in studies in rodents and non-human primates and humans, that the antisense mediated inhibition of APOS3 message R in the liver, in fact, lowered plasma triglycerides. And so this was a, a groundbreaking um, observation that for the first time provided a very novel way to lower triglycerides. Well, FCS, as we said, uh, as Rob explained to you, is primarily due to inhibition of lipoprotein lipase activity. So in thinking about using valanosaurcin and FCS, the paradigm was sort of was saying if you inhibit APOC3, you might reason that it would be not helpful because after all, I just said that APOC3 inhibited lipoprotein lipase, but lipoprotein activity is absolutely absent in patients who have FCS. So why would you consider using valanosaurcin to inhibit APOC3 in these patients? Well, it turns out that in the literature, there was evidence that lipoprotein lipase uh, was also independent clearance, that is some of these other pathways shown on the right side of this cartoon might also be dependent on APOC3. And actually some of that data was 10 years old, but everybody had discounted that because it had been determined in mice. But uh, the scientists at Ionis and the clinician thought if ever there was a way to test whether or not APOC3 inhibition worked, uh, on the LPL independent pathway, it would be in patients who didn't have LPL to begin with, uh, as you can see. And so what you can see is that a study was done, a pilot study in three patients who had genetically shown deletion of, APOC, of a LPL activity. And remarkably, there was a very dramatic reduction in the triglyceride levels proving that the LPL independent pathway was important too. And you can see that this study, which is published in the New England Journal, only had three patients and therefore represented novel biology. Well, this was repeated a number of years later using a larger number of FCS patients, 66. And again, it confirmed the results showing that there was a 71% reduction in triglycerides uh, and these triglycerides were very high to begin with. So this really, for the first time, points out the potential therapy and a potential novel therapy for treating FCS patients with lowering triglycerides below a value that would um, result in, in pancreatitis. So can I go back? Yeah. So you can see that the lessons that we learned are that APOC3 inhibits both LPL-dependent clearance as well as LPL-independent clearance, and therefore it's central regulator of triglyceride levels and inhibition of APOC3 with a drug like valanosaurcin should be applicable to lowering triglyceride uh, of any etiology, but especially pertinent to our conference for patients with FCS. And I know some of these slides are advancing on their own. The Valanosaurcin um, was just to quickly point out that in an open label extension study in which there were patients both with FCS as well as multifactorial uh, Kalamacronemia syndrome, it was effective in lowering in a real life situation, not even in a clinical trial, but here you can see where patients were doing it and it was producing very dramatic reductions. Now, Valanosaurcin has actually been approved in Europe, but it was not approved in America because there were some side effects, such as thrombocytopenia, that made it uh, less desirable. And so, um, what's been done 
was to take this antisense and to put a, a molecule of of galactosamine on it uh, attached to it and the galactosamine actually binds to a receptor on the liver called the uh, acyloglycoprotein receptor which is present in a high concentration and it binds in, and internalizes the antisense and then the um, the ligand the antisense is cleaved off and then it can go into the into the liver cells and go into the nucleus where it can inhibit the um, production of, of, of the APOC3 protein. And the importance is because it's targeted directly to the liver, much lower doses can be used. And now it's been widely confirmed that when doing this, it, it, um, the much lower doses that still achieve the APOC3 lowering also uh, reduce the side effects to a very uh, tolerable level. And this is just this new drug, which is called all its arson. You can see it causes a dose-dependent decrease in patients with hypertrochlosteridemia. And the good news is that it um, has just been tested in a phase three trial of patients with FCS. And although all the results are not yet in, uh, it was reported uh, at the American Heart Association that um, the very important benefit of lowering triglycerides is that it actually reduced the number of a new pa new cases of acute pancreatitis. So um, there is a new effective therapy available for FCS that hopefully after it goes through the new regulatory findings in a short period of time will be available to reduce triglycerides sufficiently to prevent um, pancreatitis pancreatitis in patients with FCS. Finally, just to be, um, the the fact that APOC3 is so effective in, in when you inhibit it in lowering triglycerides has led other uh, industry um, company, pharmaceutical companies to develop their own antisense and in fact, other approaches of other proteins that are known to affect triglycerides are also being attacked. So in the near future, uh, it's very likely that we'll have a number of therapies that will be highly effective um, in, in lowering triglycerides. So I hope that um, makes it clear to you why the APOC3, at least, has been a very valuable target and that effective therapies are around the corner. And with that, I'll turn it back to Rob. Great. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Whitstam. So, um, yeah, these uh, these anti-APOC3 drugs are like a true uh, breakthrough in, in the management of these patients, which in fact was in many, it was was often, often like, I wouldn't, not quite to far as say a, a lost cause, but certainly amongst the most challenging in lipidology to treat. So it is fantastic that we now have these uh, therapies on the brink that provide hope. So just to summarize what we've uh, what we've discussed this evening so far, diet and lifestyle at the moment are the cornerstone, the mainstay of FCS management. Um, it is important for def definite uh, you know for uh, to be definitive to, to you know to uh, confirm a genetic cause if it's accessible i mean that's the that's the issue is the accessibility of the genetic testing you 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 can use a you know clinical suspicion or clinical that clinical scoring of fcs but in fact you know we're living in 2023 it's the genomic era and uh, th these are genomic treatments <laughs> so it's good to confirm the cause genetically Current therapy options are not uh, are not sufficient, but fortunately, on the horizon, we now have these uh, very promising antisense treatments based, you know, directed to RNA. The uh, and these do appear to safely give prolonged and effective reductions in triglyceride levels. So, just to finish on the story of our patient, so he was able to receive through a special access program, uh, Valanosorsen at that dose of, for that drug, uh, two milligrams, or sorry, 300 milligrams uh, biweekly uh, subcutaneous. And here you can see that the triglyceride levels then came down. So really, you know, when you, if you think he started at 6,000 and then with um, lifestyle was around 2,500, so there was a further 
50 to 60 percent reduction. Cholesterol is never an issue, as it is you know typically not with with these patients, uh, but definitely was in a much better better place with his triglycerides. Some challenging uh, clinical challenges, fatigue, GI disturbances, social issues. So. Um, uh, the SMART goals, we are you know, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely, see the patients with severe hypertriglyceridemia and receive genetic screening if accessible, support patients by uh, with FCS by providing resources to connect with other patients, engage the full multidisciplinary team in the management, and educate patients with on, on the topic of ongoing therapies and ability to uh, participate in clinical trials. I think we're now in the question and answer session. We do have a few minutes for questions, and I will arm seeing that we have some coming in. So I'm going to open that up and I'll ask my uh, colleagues to stay, be on standby. So the first question is a clinical diagnosis of FCS sufficient, or do you need the genetic test to treat? So what do you think, uh, Alan? Um. Obviously, if the genetic test is available, it's very useful. But as you've already alluded to, it oftentimes isn't. And therefore, if you, you can make a, a diagnosis on clinical grounds, you've got the, the current uh, type of, um, of tool that I mentioned to you. And there are new tools being developed, as you know, Rob, specifically for North American populations. So I think if the patient fits the criteria clinically, you don't have to have the genetic testing. And then, uh, yeah, I totally agree. We have a, and we have a new uh, a new scoring system for North America that should be published hopefully next year. Uh, does a negative panel so if the genetic testing is negative, but the clinical score is positive? Does that still mean FCS? So I, I you know, I would say you know, yes. I mean, a lot of it then depends on the the. Uh, the, the issues of what a, what a third party payer then would consider, but you could you can certainly say there would be a term of you know indeterminate genetic testing, but clinically consistent with FCS. So I would say you know there's the wording that would fit that. Uh, another question: Will the antisense drugs benefit patients with non FCS, and should we suggest? So uh, Joe, what do you think with uh, with the non FCS? So the multifactorial anemia, do, do you think we would get just as much benefit with the uh, targeting APOC3? Yes, um, as, as I indicated the methods, because in the method slide, it inhibits both the LPL dependent and the LPL independent. And since many, uh, most multifactorial patients will have some degree of LPL activity, you, you will get benefit from that side as well as the LPL independent. And all the preliminary data from Ionis as well as uh, some of the other companies now making them is, is highly effective in in all hyper severe hypertrichosardemic patients. Yeah, for sure. Question about gene editing. So I'm aware that Verve is uh, Verve, which reported this amazing results in the ten patients that I'm sure you saw, like on Monday, uh, made the media on in familial hypercholesterolemia. So I'm aware that they actually have a program as well in ANGPTL3, and I, I think there is also an interest um, in several of these gene editing companies on uh, APOC3 as a target. But it's very, very, very early days for that. Question for Jeff, uh, are you currently taking, in addition to your diet, are you taking any medications for your triglycerides? I am. Uh, I am taking the phenofibrate and Vasipa along with a small statin. Nothing's giving any adverse effects, so uh, my doctor feels if it's not hurting, at least hopefully can help a little bit. So that thank you for that. And then along those lines, so what do you think? So the Vesipa, the marine fatty acids, omega-3, uh, Alan, what do you think about um, FCS patients receiving those? Uh, what, what, what's the current thinking? Yeah, I don't think they should receive them. I mean, marine fatty acids are fatty acids. They're absorbed in chylomicrons. They form chylomicrons. It just doesn't make sense for them to get it. However, one's got to consider the possibility of essential fatty acid deficiency. So one needs to get a small amount of essential fatty acids from polyunsaturated fatty acids, but I wouldn't recommend marine oils as a therapy to bring triglycerides down in FCS because they don't work. Yeah, and 
And uh, anyway, final question about the approval status of Alanis arson not approved by FDA, Ola's arson being, will be considered by the FDA. So we, sorry we didn't get to every single question, but we got to most of them. So I'd like to uh, then, uh, that's all we have the time for uh, today. Um, let me just go back to the oh, presentation. And uh, just to um, just to thank uh, to thank my colleagues and and to uh, after the show, sorry, there you can visit the rare disease hub and there are free resources and activities. So there's the the website there for you to uh, to visit um, and to receive the CME credits for this, you have to complete the post test and evaluation online and click on the request credit credit tab to complete the process and to to get your certificate and um, I would like to sincerely thank everybody so to thank uh, Dr. Chait, Dr. Whitstam, uh, Jeff Wortelic, our patient representative and to thank the uh, the people that organized this and the sponsor and to thank all of you for attending and hopefully um, you have enjoyed it as much as we have so thanks very much everybody.